Can everyone hear me in the back? Good. So uh, thank you for coming here. I hope you are enjoying the conference as much as I am. Uh, this talk is about the state of uh, vulnerability exploits. And uh, before we jump into the details, a little bit background on how this talk came to be. So during my day job, uh, what uh, I do is me and my team, we create signatures to identify vulnerabilities. And uh, d while doing that, what we also do is we analyze these vulnerabilities and analyze a lot of different attributes about these vulnerabilities. And uh, this talk is about uh, basically analysis of various other attributes about uh, these vulnerabilities uh, from the last uh, year or so. Uh, so uh, the agenda for the next uh, 40 minutes or so is that we'll take a quick look at vulnerabilities, uh, some of the additional attributes which include exploits and exploit kits for those vulnerabilities. We'll look at uh, some of the um, trends that we found in the last year or so. And finally, we'll conclude with uh, how we can use this information in our day-to-day -day, um, day -day jobs. So uh, this is a quick chart of the number of vulnerabilities over the course of years. Now again, uh, not to confuse, these are unique vulnerabilities for commercial software. So these do not include any of the vulnerabilities that are in custom software or in custom web apps. So to give you an example, this would include, let's say, a an Apache vulnerability, a PHP vulnerability, a Word vulnerability, an Adobe vulnerability. And what it will not include is vulnerabilities that are there in custom web applications written by, um, written by organizations. So uh, is, is everyone okay, uh, clear with this definition? Because I don't want uh, a lot, uh, there could be a misunderstanding about vulnerabilities and where these numbers are. These vulnerabilities can also, are also tracked by various other institutions like NVD, the National Vulnerability Database, US CERT. So this, this, this data is basically uh, extracted uh, from various databases. Also, what we saw was that uh, in a typical uh, organization, or organization, defenders, so basically people who are um, who are in charge of defending or making sure that uh, there are no vulnerabilities exploited in their uh, organization, gets vulnerability reports, and they include tons of vulnerabilities. Has, has anyone here looked at like a typical vulnerability report from your organization or some other organization, as a, um, which is like a result of a vulnerability scan? Mm. So typically, there are a lot more vulnerabilities that, than you could address. So uh, when I talk with people, there are, they, they say that there are too many vulnerabilities, and these are not false positives, not false negatives. These are good, correct vulnerabilities, but too many vulnerabilities which are reported to the IT team. And uh, there is a big problem on how to prioritize them. And the reason I show this graph is because, just to illustrate that every year you have about, uh, let's say, 6,000 to 8,000 vulnerabilities added uh, in the software that you use. And plus, there are vulnerabilities from the last few years. So what this uh, presentation uh, uh, intends to do is uh, look at some of the trends of what is happening. And at the end of the day, it should help uh, people in defending better. So uh, again, how, how do you prioritize all the vulnerability reports that you get? Now, I'm not going to go through the definition of a vulnerability. I think everyone here clearly understands that like, a vulnerability is basically a flaw in the software. So you consider Apache. There is some bug in Apache. There is some vulnerability in Apache. So that's a vulnerability. And the example that I have here is uh, a vulnerability in Adobe Flash. Uh, the reason I took Flash is because uh, last two, three years, most of, a lot of exploits have been found uh, in Adobe Flash. If you remember, maybe like 
eight years ago or something like that, Microsoft Word, Excel, maybe 10 years ago, had this uh, pretty, pretty big part problem of vulnerabilities being exploited. Mm, then that shifted from Microsoft uh, applications to Java type of applications, JRE applications, and uh, currently the sort of a crown of mm, the highest exploited vulnerabilities is, is, is with Flash, or at least uh, uh, that's what we see according to the numbers here. So we saw what a vulnerability is. What's an exploit? An exploit is basically uh, um, a proof of concept, basically. So, for example, a vulnerability exists in Adobe Flash. Yeah, fine, it's a vulnerability. There is a report, there is a patch. An exploit is a proof of concept, a code, uh, executable, something that makes use of that vulnerability to get into an application. So, uh, the same vulnerability that we saw in the previous slide, this is the exploit for it. Uh, in two of the open source uh, exploit databases. So there was an exploit in Metasploit. Oh, uh, sorry, there was an exploit here in Core Security and in Exploit DB. And these are some of the exploit databases. Now, how many of you have heard about Metasploit? Most, most of them, good. Uh, exploit DB? Most of them. So uh, Metasploit, ExploitDB, these are free open source exploit databases where you could go and download an exploit for a vulnerability. That will do something like uh, it, it, it will open a calculator just to prove a concept that if, the, uh, if I can open a calculator, I can also run any executable. Core security, uh, immunity, these are some of the paid services, but they also have basically have exploits, maybe a little bit more exploits than uh, others or different type of exploits. So, okay, so there are these three uh, important concepts that we are gonna look at. We already looked at vulnerabilities that you all are familiar with. We already looked at exploits, which are again written by white hat community, by researchers. And the third concept is that of an exploit kit. Now, how many of you have uh, pretty familiar with exploit kits? So exploit kits, uh, and, and that's, that's, a, that's a good number actually. So exploit kits are basically malware toolkits uh, written by malware writers, which can help other malware writers in creating, uh, creating basically malware. So these days, uh, if let's say I'm a bad guy, I don't have to be really technically savvy to understand vulnerabilities, to understand shell code, to understand how to get inside a box, how to do a RCE, remote code execution of my shell code. I really don't need to be that technically savvy. All I need to do is uh, have contacts or buy, um, exploit kit code or have my ex my code hosted by one of these exploit kits. So you can think of exploit kits as cloud-based services for bad people. So um, they are either cloud-based services or they are toolkits that you can just download and put on your web page. And this is, uh, let, let, let's see how these exploit kit work uh, really quick. So on the left hand side you have your PC, the PC of, um, of the victim. When the victim, let's say, clicks on a bulletin board or on a Facebook link or something which is posted by the malicious user, um, it gets directed to, let's say, a malicious page. Now this page, uh, let's say I am an attacker and I'm not a very technically savvy attacker. I have just written a program to let's say uh, mm, record all the keystrokes on your machine. Okay, this is just a program, a normal program which records keystrokes. It does not know how to infiltrate your machine. It does not know how to attack your machine. It does not know how to get on your machine. It just, it's just a program. You can download it, you can run it on your machine and what it does, it, it basically, let's say, uh, just records keystrokes. So as a sort of a dumb attacker, I have written this program. So when the innocent person clicks on a link, it, it, it goes on my web page. But what I have done is I have included an exploit kit in my, uh, embedded an exploit kit in my web page. So basically what happens is the request goes to the exploit kit hosting provider, 
Now, these, these are bad guys. These are exploit kit hosting providers. And they basically take care of finding what operating system is running on the machine, what browser is running, is the, what, what version of browser is there, is the browser vulnerable, what are the various uh, plugins uh, into the, running into the, blob, into the browser, are the p plugins vulnerable, is a Flash plugin installed, is Silverlight installed. And after determining all this, they uh, basically, that exploit kit will give that type of, uh, all of, will execute that type of exploit. If they, let's say, find you have Adobe Flash or Silverlight version, this, 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 which is vulnerable to a certain thing, they would run this exploit and take my keyboard, uh, take my program with just, uh, records keystrokes and cause the remote code exec execution and basically install that program on your machine. And then that's how you get the exploit. By the way, this is a pretty good screen capture. It's from uh, Microsoft and the link is uh, down here. So uh, if you want to review it later, you can just go to the Microsoft uh, link here. I'm, I'm really bad at drawing images, so I just take it from places. So uh, essentially, that's how an exploit kit works, which enables uh, sort of not very technically savvy malicious users to put their bad code on masses, on large amount of machines. Uh, as, as you can see, these, uh, um, these URLs, they change constantly. So it's not like uh, it's, there's always like a cat and mouse game of the takedown people who try to find these exploit kits, try to find which countries they are located in, try to find the authorities and take the URL down. And then again, once the URL is down, it pops up somewhere else in some other part of the world. So anyway, these are uh, exploit kits. What I have here is some of the screen captures of what a malicious, uh, like a malware writer, like the non-technical malware writer would get from this exploit kit. So these are the web UI of an exploit kit. So I'm a malicious malware writer, I'm using an exploit kit, and I, s I get these uh, interfaces where, it, where I can log in and I can see which IPs uh, uh, were able to compromise to what OSs were there, what browsers were used, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, as you can see, this exploit kit business is really uh, commercialized. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a SaaS-based malware service that basically if you have the right contacts, you can, you can subscribe to or buy or uh, to infect hundreds and thousands of machines. And these are the players. So these are some of the top exploit kits that we have been tracking. I think Angler is the number one. Um, just Exploit is another one. Black Hole, Crime Pack. These are, and as you can see, they have like well-defined user interfaces, logos, icons. So it's 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 really uh, it's really commercialized. So anyway, that's what we know. We know about vulnerabilities. We know about exploits. We know about exploit kits. How can we uh, basically make use of this information to defend against it? Or how can we as defenders use this information? So uh, what I'll do is I will we'll go quickly through some of, the, uh, some of the trends that we saw in the last year or so. Most affected vendors. So um, this chart shows which, uh, for which vendor most exploits were written in the last year. And this was not much of a surprise for us. It was uh, Microsoft was number one, followed by Adobe, Apple, Oracle, and then there are like various uh, small vendors in the others group, which is the 50% or 55% of the group. So we were like, okay, Microsoft is the vendor which has the most amount of exploits written. Uh, what happens basically is that uh, the reason I think Microsoft is number one here is traditionally lots of machines have uh, Windows and Microsoft software. And also because, uh, let's say, uh, next week is Patch Tuesday. Um, how many of you get involved in Patch Tuesday, in patching, in at least your machine must be rebooting on Patch Tuesday, right, if you are using Windows. So uh, there is a race after Patch Tuesday, as in, uh, one, 
attackers can go and try to find new vulnerabilities that even Microsoft or no one knows about. That takes some time and effort. But an easier thing that people do is that after a patch is released, attackers start immediately binary diffing what was patched, so diff the patched DLL versus the unpatched DLL, and try to find out uh, what was patched, and therefore find what the vulnerability was. So Patch Tuesday, I mean, it is a big thing in IT because they have to install patches, but also what happens is attackers, they immediately start to do this binary diffing, trying to try to find out what the vulnerability was fixed, so that they have a certain amount of window because not everyone patches the same day or same week or not even the same month. So they have this window of opportunity where in like two or three days, if they are able to find out what was uh, patched and what the vulnerability was, they can uh, implement those uh, vulnerabilities uh, or weaponize them into exploit kits. So uh, only about 26 ex uh, percent of exploits targeted operating systems. So out of all the exploits that we studied in the last year, most of them targeted applications. Now this doesn't mean that uh, if you are a, a person from IT, a defender, if there is an OS patch, you just ignore it. It just gives you a sense of priority on uh, if, if you have only one person to do the patch and if you have certain OS and certain applications. Traditionally, we saw more applications were targeted. Local versus uh, remote exploits. So uh, on Metasploit, exploit DB core, in all these exploits, there are a lot of exploits that are, um, uh, that are local and that, which require physical access. I mean, either physical or logical, but access to the machine. The attacker has to be logged into the machine first for the exploit to be successful. These are mostly elevation of privilege type of exploits where you need lower privileges and the exploit uh, puts you or gives you higher privileges. While a remote exploit usually doesn't require any type of, uh, mm, any type of uh, access or can be done remotely uh, with little access. So um, what we saw was about 80% of exploits where we, we, we were able to do, uh, they were able to compromise machines remotely. So what, what are all these trends, uh, how, how can they help us? And oh, before going there, these are some of the, I don't know if they are readable, but some of the examples, some example CVs of local versus remote exploits. Most of the local exploits are kernel EOP or kernel elevation of privileges type of uh, exploits. So when we looked at the data again, what we saw was that yes, Microsoft was the number one vendor which had the most exploits. But most of those exploits were uh, local. So if you look at the remote chart, Microsoft is small here. And if you look at the local access, Microsoft is big here. In the remote chart, Adobe is bigger. So what that basically tells is that more remote exploits were found within Adobe than in Microsoft. So this can be, again, one, one, one tool of prioritization is that, yes, as an IT person, I want to make sure that all vulnerabilities are squished, all patches are installed. But uh, from at least talking with people, talking with customers, we know that prioritization is the number one, uh, the most difficult thing that most people find because uh, in a typical vulnerability scan of a network, there are so many tons and tons of vulnerabilities found that people, even larger organizations, just simply don't have resources to fix them. So what, uh, and, and as, as I said earlier, these, uh, some of these things can be used in combination, as we will see later, to do this prioritization. Another thing is uh, lateral movement. So we also studied what's the potential of lateral movement on a vulnerability. As I said, I'm not very good at drawing uh, things. So this is from uh, Trend Micro, and the link is below here. So I think everyone knows what lateral movement is, right? It's basically once uh, an attacker compromises a machine, what can he or she do? Like, how can he, they move laterally into the organization and try to 
uh, either infect other machines or try to find out information on machines in, their, in, the, in the neighborhood of the machine that is compromised. So uh, these are just uh, some examples. Uh, again, they, I'm not going to go through them, but uh, some of the vulnerabilities had a high lateral movement where the potential of the, uh, the impact of that vulnerability was uh, so high that the attacker could move laterally, while some of them have low lateral movement. So why this is important? So what, what, what we can do is we can basically, when you get that vulnerability report with hundreds and thousands of vulnerability to fix, you can combine various attributes and say that, okay, show me vulnerabilities that are remotely exploitable, that do not require any uh, privilege to start with, and vulnerabilities with high lateral movement, and uh, fix those vulnerabilities first, and then maybe focus later on vulnerabilities. Uh, you can also add only vulnerabilities for applications, and then say, okay, then in the second phase, I'll fix the vulnerabilities that have low lateral movement or need some sort of credentials or or uh, local privilege elevation and things like that. Uh, another thing that we observed was uh, exploits for end of life applications. Now this is a very, uh, uh, how can I describe it, a very sticky situation. What happens is, as, as I mentioned to you that on, uh, and, and this is not to point fingers at Microsoft or Adobe or Apple or any one vendor, it happens for all vendors. When a patch is released, attackers start diffing the patch with the unpatched uh, components to find where the vulnerability was, how can I attack it? And uh, that is, uh, I mean, that, that's what happens. But uh, for end of life application, most or all vendors, they do not uh, basically tell if a vulnerability or a patch is applicable for end of life applications. So what I mean is, again, for convenience, let's take Windows Server 2003 as an example. Uh, how many of you have like Windows Server 2003 in your environment? Couple of people. So that's an end of life application. So that means that the vendor is not going to provide a patch for that machine. But it also means that the vendor is not all going to tell you if newer vulnerability, so next week is Patch Tuesday, right? if there is a Windows Server 2008 vulnerability, we will not know if that same vulnerability affects Windows Server 2003, which is end of life. Uh, the bad part about it is that attackers don't care. They, if they are able to figure out the exploit, they will just run that exploit on the list, on, on the list of affected operating system given by the vendor but also on older operating systems because a lot of people have Windows 2003 or Windows 2000 and a lot of older software that they cannot upgrade for various various other reasons. So the reason this is a little bit of a, uh, we are in a little, little bit of a pickle here is because now you have a patch for the newer operating system. Attackers have figured out what the vulnerability is. And for newer operating systems, we are fine, we can patch. But for the older operating systems, there is no patch. So uh, the page that I have pointed here is, is, is the Qualys web page of the company that I work for. What we do is we, uh, we uh, run these newer exploits again against older operating systems and tell, uh, tell everyone basically that yes, this newer exploit works against these older operating systems. So even though the vendor, there is no patch for the older operating system, the vendor has not mentioned this older operating system into the vulnerability advisory, this does affect your older operating system. So and I'm sure there are many other resources on the web like this where you can uh, look at this, this data. This is another screenshot of basically, uh, I think one of the vulnerabilities which was um, not listed as affected for the end of life application, but um, um, it, it did work for older operating systems. So uh, again, when we come to prioritization, only about 7% of vulnerabilities in 2015 that we studied had an associated exploit. So as, as, as I was mentioning earlier that uh, 
in a typical IT environment, there are tons and tons of vulnerabilities found, more than what they can fix. This is a universal problem. It just doesn't affect. Uh, small organizations or mid-sized organizations. It affects large, huge corporations as well. Because uh, although larger organizations have uh, more staff, more people, the networks, the resources they are managing are also exponential. So, uh, and most people like uh, have their own prioritization schemes. So some people would be using CVSS scores, to really see what is the criticality of that vulnerability so that they can fix the high critical vulnerabilities first. Some organizations use the scores given by the uh, vendor, the software vendor. Some organizations use scores uh, given by, the by their vulnerability management vendor, which basically finds these vulnerabilities and creates reports on vulnerabilities. And that is all good. Uh, but what I think we can do is we can also use the exploitability in that mix, which is basically, yes, uh, vulnerability is severe, but if there is no exploit for it today, and if there, if there is some other vulnerability which is, uh, which is like, let's say, not critical but important, but there is an exploit today, then it's, uh, we can use that information to take a decision, what do I want to fix today? Do I want to fix the critical vulnerability that doesn't have an exploit but could have an exploit, or this important vulnerability that definitely has an exploit? Uh, these are some of the vulnerabilities, and again, uh, nothing really to point out during the presentation, but after the presentation, I think if you have time to look at just one slide from this entire presentation, look at this slide, because this has uh, essentially all the CVEs listed <coughs> which uh, have exploit kits associated with it. So basically, we looked at three things, right? One was vulnerability, one was exploit, which is just a proof of concept code, and the third was exploit kits, which, which is basically where the exploits have been weaponized, where malware, uh, not just one, but a lot of malware is written using the exploit kits on the internet. So these are some of the CVEs and vulnerabilities for which, uh, in the last year, for which exploit kits are actively working. So if you have any of these vulnerabilities in your organization, then I would say just run, 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 and fix these first because there is total proof that they are being actively exploited. It only needs some user in your organization to click some link somewhere to, to get exploited. So um, coming to the last slide, which is one of the la la slides, is that only 1% of all the vulnerabilities had an exploit kit associated with it. So why, why is this good or why not really good, but why is this important? So the blue charts are basically the number of vulnerabilities in that year. The yellow ones are the vulnerabilities where an exploit was available for that vulnerability. And the red ones are the ones where an exploit kit was associated with a vulnerability. So this, these are unique vulnerabilities. If you have like, let's say 100,000 machines in your organization, the number of vulnerabilities you will find in your vulnerability report would be this multiplied by the number of assets. So uh, what one can easily do in their prioritization mechanism is first look at the smaller set of vulnerabilities, the red ones which have exploit kits available where we definitely know that these vulnerabilities are actively attacked right now. Fix those first. Then second, fix the yellow ones, which basically have some proof of concept exploit code, but uh, we don't know if they are actively, uh, that exploit is weaponized or not. Mm, again, it can be weaponized very soon, but at least uh, according to the threat intel now, they are not weaponized as of today. They can be weaponized tomorrow and then fix the rest of the vulnerabilities where there is no exploit code available. So what can we do um, from all this? Uh, I think a lot of people that we talk to, they, uh, they, have, they have issues in simple things like inventoring, in sort of uh, finding what applications are installed in their organization and what versions are installed in their organization. 
So what we can, I mean, if you want to take home some to-do notes from this talk, what you can do is in the next week or so, try to find applications from that uh, slide that I showed you and try to find if your organization has any of those uh, applications and the versions that are currently being exploited by an exploit kit. Try to find which end of life applications exist in your organization for which uh, exploits are working. And since they are end of life, there is no patch. So um, that's the sticky situation that I talked about. Vulnerabilities with working exploits and vulnerabilities that can be uh, remotely compromised. So um, if you are uh, um, a defender who basically has this in their job profile is to basically defend their organization and you look at vulnerability reports on a day-to-day -day basis. These are, these are some of the things that you can do to, for prioritization. In the next month or so, uh, as I mentioned, the EOL applications are really tricky because the reason most organizations have end-of-life applications are because they cannot be upgraded and it is hosting something very important. So um, a lot of SCADA type uh, environments, industrial control uh, type of environments like uh, factory floors and things like that. We have seen Windows XP, Windows 2000, which is being used to control the conveyor belts on a factory floor in the electrical grid systems. And a lot of these uh, SCADA or ICS uh, type of applications have these older applications. Mm, the, uh, the only advice here is try to upgrade them as, as soon as possible. Mm. And patch all the vulnerabilities that have the exploit kits or exploit packs available uh, associated with them. And in the next quarter or so, mm, try to see if a lot of these applications where exploit packs are associated with, are they really needed or essential for your organization? So we did this like a small experiment which where we basically uninstalled um, the Adobe Flash Player from some of the users in, in, in just my team. I, I cannot do this company-wide and just ask them to do their day-to-day -day work. And a lot of people were able to do it. There was no one really complained. Some users, they did uh, basically uh, lost some functionality. Uh, but I think this is ultimately in uh, something that you have to decide whether certain applications are really essential. And typically applications like uh, Adobe Flash, which are right now really being exploited left and right by these exploit kits. So with that, I will open up with for any questions that you may have. Otherwise, there is a wonderful lunch waiting for us. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you.